Is Mondelez, which is in the same industry as Hershey, an undervalued buy now stock? In today's episode, we are going to find the answer to this question. We're going to look at the historical performance of this company. We're going to take a look at their income statement, their top line revenue, bottom line net income growth year on year. We're going to look at the health of the company, their total cash versus their total debt. We'll also compare them to Hershey as well as other companies in the same industry on a total return basis and over the last five years. We'll also have a quick sneak at what the institutions are doing, whether they are buying or selling. And we will also see what is the dividend safety and the supporting financial metrics that we need to understand before investing in this company. And we'll also dive into their latest investor presentation, taking a look at this company beneath the hood and really trying to get a good sense of where the company is heading. And as always, we will run them through our valuation model get into our intrinsic value and finding the acceptable buy price given that investor margin of safety. Now year to date it is up around 8% which is positive to see although it does lag the S&P 500 which is up around 16 to 17%. We do see it in the midpoint of the 52 week range with a yield of around 2.4% currently. Now investors who have been holding the company over the last 10 years would be up a fairly decent 104% bearing in mind it doesn't include those dividends reinvested and we can see it did hit its peak over this period at around $78, $79 in the mid part of 2023. Now let's take a look at that income statement and what we can see on the top line and remember we do aim for 3 to 7% growth year on year. Well 2018 26 billion on the top line, 2022 31.5 billion. So we do see some growth over the last 5 years, but on a more granular level what we do in fact see is fairly flat revenue from 18 to 19 with a small increase to 2020 and then a nice increase to 2021 and 2022 and it is positive to see that, that trailing 12 months is showing signs of a strong 2023 which we will analyze when we get those results over the next few months. So overall, very nice to see it has grown over the last five years and we will analyze the last 10 years percentage wise too shortly. Net income, what story do we see? Well, 3.3 billion reported of net income on 2018 and 2.7 billion in 2022. So in actual fact, their bottom line has done the opposite of revenue. Their top line has increased over the period whilst their bottom line has in fact declined. Again, a more granular level tells us it did increase from 18 to 19 before dropping to 2020 and then picking up and then dropping again. And like the top line, we are expecting to see a nice increase on the bottom line from 2022 to 2023. So some slight inconsistencies, but nonetheless, we do in actual fact see an increase from both the last five years on the top line and bottom line. Now a quick health check on the balance sheet, total cash versus total debt. 1.2 billion of cash and short-term investments held in 2018. 1.6 billion in their latest quarterly report so they are holding more cash than they did five years ago now numerically and directionally what does the total debt tell us well 18.8 billion in 2018 so they do hold a fair amount of debt this did increase in their latest quarterly report to around 20.5 billion so we do see whilst their cash has increased slightly so has their total debt and we'll analyze that dividend safety and net debt to EBITDA metric shortly so companies in a similar industry, we have Kraft Heinz, Dan under Hershey Company, General Mills. Year to date, what we see for Mondelez, it is up around 10%, the middle performer of its peers. Whilst we do see the ever popular Hershey, which we did review yesterday on the channel, down 15%. Now, when we take a look at the last five years, which is always good when we have the data, the more data we can see, the better the analysis. Mondelez is up around 80%, so it is around the second best performing of its peers. But we do see Hershey there, the best performing at 95%. As always, do remember past performance is never indicative of the future. Now, institutional ownership for Mondelez sits at 76%. 8.8 billion worth of shares sold over the last 12 months. And over the same period, we do see around 11.4 billion bought. So institutions are buying more shares than they are selling. And in the latest quarter, we see a small margin of increase or inflows over the outflows whereas we see an opposite in quarter two and again the opposite in quarter one. So again, just something to bear in mind, but as always, we have to do our own due diligence and we can't just copy what the institutions are doing. Now, before we jump into the all-important dividend safety and financial metrics, we can look at the latest earnings from Mondelez and what we see is they beat both on the top line and the earnings per share. For earnings per share, 78 cents was expected. They did beat that by 4 cents per share. And on the top line, 8.81 billion of revenue expected. Again, 
they did beat that 9 billion or 9.03. If we look at the other two quarters in 2023, again, they beat both on the top line as well as the earnings per share. And March 2023, again, another beat. So they have beaten the last three quarters for 2023. Now, very quickly, comparing Q3 of 2023 versus Q3 of 2022, what we in actual fact see, increase on the top line, very nice to see, an increase on the bottom line, increased earnings per share, as well as the margin and operating income. So it's very nice to see they did increase on both the top line as well as the bottom line in comparison to the same quarter in 2022. Now we can take a very quick look at their investor presentation, and this is something just to run through for those that are new to the company. In terms of their global share, well, in terms of chocolates, they are number two with 12.7% market share. Biscuits, both sweet and savory, they are number one, 17.2% market share. And both cake and pastries and snack bars, they are number three in terms of global position for that market. So very strong to see, but there is still room for them to grow. And in terms of looking here at their core snacks categories, we do see that this has grown quite nicely over the last five years with a very strong 10% increase in 2022. What's also very positive and interesting to see is they have some very strong iconic brands worth over 1 billion as we see here. A lot of these you will have heard of, Oreo, Cadbury, Ritz, The Biscuits, Chips Ahoy, Milka. And on top of that, they are number one in some key snack markets. We have the US, we have Europe, we have the UK, we have China and we have India. So this is a very big company. And for those that didn't notice, when we do take a look, they also have a larger market cap, 97.3 billion than Hershey's. And likewise, they do have a significant more in terms of the employees, 91,000 versus 19,000. Now, we can also see these metrics, which we will also touch upon very shortly now. But dividends declared per share over the last five years has gone from 96 cents to $1.47, double digit dividend growth. They also have done share buybacks, as we can see here. And again, we will touch upon that. And in terms of shareholder return, 16.1% per year for the last four years for Mondelez versus an average of 11.3% for their peers. Now, when we take a look at those all-important dividend safety metrics and financial metrics, we see a dividend safety score of 66, making it safe. Market cap, 97 billion, so it is a large cap company. And when we look at some recessionary metrics for those that see a recession inbound, they maintained the dividend during the 07-09 recession. They didn't increase it, but they also didn't cut it. Negative 19%, which although was below the average growth of companies during the S&P 500 recession of 07-09, they did outperform by negative 35% versus the S&P's negative 55. Double digit dividend growth this year. We love to see that. 10% this year, July. 12% over the last five years. Again, very strong. But we do see a slight mediocre percentage over the last 20 years of 5% given I always advocate for a minimum of 4% on the channel to keep up with inflation. Now we can see they have been paying increasing dividends over the last nine years and dividend yield theory states a company is undervalued when the current yield sits above the first year average and what we can see here is one sign of undervaluation slash reasonable valuation given how near it is to the five year average. In terms of the forward PE, it is looking in line with the five-year average. But remember, we never look at any of these models in isolation and we'll draw our conclusions towards the end of the episode. Consumer staples, though, sector PE, significantly lower, 18.7 versus Mondelez's 21.1. And as mentioned, it is right there in the midpoint of the 52-week range. As always, earnings payout is susceptible to manipulation by management through accounting, so we ignore that. We look at the free cash flow. Now, personally, I like to see below 60%. It gives me faith that management have the ability to offer those double-digit increases if they would like to. For the large part, it has been below 60%. We do see some years where it goes higher. 2022, 67%. 2023, expected to be around 60, the mid-60s. So I would like to see and expect another double-digit increase to the dividend in 2024. Free cash flow per share now 270 in 2013. That was seemingly quite high. It did drop all the way down for the next few years and then picked up. So 2022, 218. But on the positive, it is expected to climb up higher again in 2023. So again, we do see some inconsistencies across the growth of the free cash flow per share. But nonetheless, from 2014 onwards, it is moving in the right direction. Now, when we take a look at sales growth, 3 to 7% is what we like to see. And realistically, from 2013 to 2019, it has had some poor growth over the period. 
It has picked up over the last few years and the trailing 12 months is looking at 16%. And as we analyzed on the financial statements, it does look like 2023 will be a very good year for this company. Numerically, this is what it means. Well, 35 billion worth of sales in 2013, 31 billion and a half in 2022. Shares outstanding, very nice to see, returning excess cash to investor pockets by doing share buybacks. As we can see, it has gone from 1.79 billion in 2013 to 1.39 billion in 2022. So that is a positive for Mondelez. Now, ROIC, 10% or more is what I like to target. And we can see that it hasn't really, unfortunately, hit that consistently. Although we do know the last two years, it has been edging towards that with the trading 12 months at 11%. So I am starting to gain some faith in this company and do believe over the long term, if they continue with this, it should be a very strong company alongside the other metrics we have analyzed. Operating margin, again, this is one of those ones that is slightly difficult for the consumer staples industry, but they have been increasing from 2013 up to around that 15 to 17% in the last few years. Likewise, with the free cash flow margin after the last few years, we do see some strong growth sitting there around 7% on that free cash flow margin. Now, net debt to EBITDA, which correlates to that dividend safety, essentially stands for the earnings before interest tax depreciation amortization. And what these numbers are showing are the number of years it would take the company to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand. We like to see below four for consumer staples. It has gone up from 2021 to 312 but do know in 2023 it's expected to come down and it's still well below that four. So, so far, unless anything fundamentally changes, it does look like that dividend itself is very safe for Mondelez International. Now we'll run them through the stock valuation model. And as always, if you do enjoy the content value is being provided, do smash that like button, hit the subscribe and bell so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop every day on your doorstep. And finally, if you want to grab a copy of the intrinsic value calculator that we're about to run through to get to the acceptable buy price and intrinsic value of companies in your own portfolio, do click on that pinned comment below. Now we are starting off with the first model, the Graham's valuation. We have the stock ticker MDLS, we have the earnings per share, 334, and we have the growth rate per analyst estimates at 10 with that current yield on AAA corporate bonds, giving the intrinsic value of $48. Now, when we look at the current trading price, that is significantly lower than the current trading price and below the 52-week low, showing signs of overvaluation based on Graham's valuation model. But bear in mind, we don't look at any of these models in isolation. The second model, the multiples valuation model, we have companies in a similar sector and size. We have Hershey, Tootsie Roll, General Mills, Dan, and the ones we analyzed on a five-year return. We have their stock price, earnings per share, P multiples of which we get the average and multiply that by the earnings per share of Mondelez to get a stock price based on the multiples valuation of $77. Now, when we take a look, it is right there up at that 52 week high, showing signs of around 5 to 10% of undervaluation in the current market. We then move on to the dividend discount model where we have the yearly dividends. We have the average growth rate. Very strong to see. Forward looking, I have gone for 6%. Now, you can argue higher. Or lower, always when you do grab a copy of the model, you can play around with your percentages based on your own investment thesis. So the DDM model, based on our estimates and judgments, gives us a price of $90, well above the 52-week high and showing some strong signs of undervaluation of Mondelez International in the current market. We then move on to the third or fourth model, in fact, the discounted cash flow model, where we have the free cash flows year on year. Average growth rate coming to 4% with analysts targeting 10%. Moving forwards with that discount rate, we get the present value of future free cash flows and terminal value. Add together with the cash to track total debt, get to the equity value, divide by shares outstanding to give a DCF price of $74. Now, when we take a look again, some very small upside around 5% to the current trading price. Now, the intrinsic value, as always, is just the average of these models we run through. And again, if you do enjoy the content, value is being provided. Do smash that like button, hit the subscribe and bell so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. Now, you can argue to remove Graham's valuation. Some people decide to keep it in. But if we do keep it in, it comes to around $72, which, as you can see, shows signs of reasonable valuation. For those that are interested to know what it is without Graham's valuation, it comes to around $80. So based on Graham's valuation, it is currently reasonably valued. Margin of safety at 10%, it would be a buy at around $65. At 20%, at around $58. And we can see that is below the 52-week low. Now, for those that do want to essentially remove Graham's valuation, we can do a central quick model on that. So we'll just update the formula just to do show this intrinsic value of $80. So if you were looking at a 10% margin of safety on those three, you would be looking at an acceptable buy of today's price at around $71, $72.
If you were looking at 20% margin of safety, you would be looking at a buy of $64, which is above the 52 week low. Now, in terms of Wall Street, what they believe the price hit over the next 12 months is roughly the intrinsic value calculated by removing Graham's valuation. So they do see around 10% upside to the current trading price. If we were to remove Graham's valuation, we would be mentioning that you would be looking at a margin of safety of 10% with an upside of 10% based on Wall Street's targets. As always, though, you should do your own due diligence and never rely on what Wall Street have to say. As always, though, let me know your thoughts on Mondelez. Is this a company that you believe is a strong buy right now or undervalued? Or how do you compare it to Hershey's, which we did analyze on the channel yesterday? Personally, for me, I am adding Hershey. This is a company that whilst I would like to add to the portfolio, I do believe to be slightly overvalued or reasonably valued at the current price and therefore would like to wait for a pullback roughly to the 52 week lows that we saw at $60. And if it doesn't hit there, then that is fine by me, but I'm more than patient to wait for this company. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments below for Mondelez. Are you a buyer? Are you a seller? Or even if you're just on the sideline speculating. If you enjoyed the episode today, do smash that like button, hit the subscribe and bell so you have these videos as they drop and as they are delivered. And finally, if you want to grab a copy of the valuation model to get your intrinsic value of companies in your own portfolio, then do click on that pinned comment below. As always, have a great day and catch you on the next episode. Take care.